Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Hayley and Greg. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm a research fellow at the Primary Industries Climate Challenges Centre at the University of Melbourne. And in a nutshell, my job is to observe, document and where possible, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from farms. And currently we've been working with the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory to create equations capable of capturing emission, re emission reductions with these technologies. Um, and so, but first of all, I'd just like to start off with a quick acknowledgement of country and I'd like to pay my respect to the Wurundjeri and Woiwurrung people, peoples of the Kulin Nation whose land I'm on today in Nam, as well as pay my respect to, to, to the traditional owners and custodians of the lands across Australia. The purpose and what I really want to come across today is what's driving the need for these methane supplements in particular over other type of greenhouse gas reduction technologies, why methane is a problem, how it really inhibits the sustainability of farms, who makes them, what they are, how effective they actually are and will be in Australian farm systems, and really go into the impact of their production and use, both the intentional and the good, and sometimes the unintentional, um, and go into a little bit of where research is heading next. I assume that most of you are very interested in grazing, and unfortunately there isn't a lot of studies done with methane supplements and grazing, but hopefully it'll give you an indication of what's coming. And then, oh, Ultimately, this will hopefully help to give you an idea of where methane supplements are going to fit into the sustainable farm systems of the future. So to start off with, here is some of, this is how some of the largest companies in the world responded to the Paris Agreement. Um, and companies quite often have a bigger impact than governments. Of the 100 largest economies in the world, 69 of them are actually companies and only 31 are countries. And so when it comes to looking at market forces, looking at how companies respond to these sorts of things is a much better indicator of, uh, a much better indicator of change. That being said, there is definitely a push from international governments. Um, both America and the EU are looking to tax um, tax imports that fail to, meet, fail to meet emission targets, emission reduction targets, which is quite a problem for Australian industry as most of our agricultural product is exported. So not only are our farmers going to miss out on getting premiums for products by reducing emissions, but ultimately without change, we're going to lose out on mainstream markets as well, which is quite concerning. Um, so why is methane a problem? Essentially because it's a greenhouse gas and contributes to the greenhouse effect, which was first observed in 1856 and has become increasingly more problematic as we continue to emit more greenhouse gases. Although a certain amount of greenhouse gases are required in the atmosphere to absorb heat and keep, our, uh, keep the earth at the lovely, lovely temperature range that we know it as today, when we increase the amount of greenhouse gases that we contribute to the atmosphere, we also can we also increase the amount of heat that it absorbs and that begins to take us out of the temperature range that is really ideal for life on Earth. Methane, of course, isn't just a greenhouse gas emission. It is one of the most important greenhouse gas. It was one of the most important greenhouse gases um, and is the largest source of greenhouse gases or largest source of methane is enteric methane emissions from ruminants. Um, in Australia, it accounts for about half of all greenhouse gas emissions in livestock and globally it's about three to five percent of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Methane is produced in the rumen, one of the ruminant stomachs, as part of digestion. So to digest ruminants to digest microbes in the rumen of ruminants, ferment feed to create volatile fatty acids, which are their energy source. But in doing this, carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas are produced as a byproduct. Methanogenic archaea or methanogens then convert these products into methane. This process is quite energetically costly. It consumes about two to 12% of all energy produced by ruminants but it is the most efficient way to remove methane gas from the rumen. And it has evolved over millions of years. It's incredibly efficient at what it does. And historically, it hasn't been a problem. Um, it's only recently because methane is produced, uh, the, because of the volume of methane that's produced and its potency that it's become a problem. 
But that being said, because it is such a complex system, there is adaptation to mitigants, which is a challenge for methane inhibitors because the biodiversity of microbes in the rumen do ultimately change and adjust to um, mitigants. Methane, of course, is a problem not just because of the volume of livestock, but the potency of methane. Although it only has a lifespan of about 8 to 12 years, which is significantly lower than carbon dioxide, the global warming potential of methane is significantly greater. So most, most um, models look at look at greenhouse gas emissions over a 100-year scale, and in that 100 years, uh, me methane is 28 times greater at absorbing heat than carbon dioxide, but in its actual lifetime, it is significantly, significantly higher than that. Um, and historically, this has made methane a big problem and a huge problem for the livestock industry in meeting um, emission reduction targets and getting to carbon neutrality. But now it's seen as a potential solution. Because we can't reduce the number of livestock without compromising food security, and we fundamentally can't change the potency of methane, there's been a shift towards looking at how we can reduce the volume of methane that's emitted. Because if we can do that, the impact is instant, it's significant, and it's very achievable. And that's where methane technologies come in. Um, historically, there's been more of a push for animal breeding and diet um, based on the technology that was available. Animal breeding aims to use heritable traits to reduce the amount of methane that's produced. So that could be increasing the productivity of a, of a ruminant to reduce the amount of time that it spends on a farm creating methane. It could be changing the rumen passage to increase the rate that feed passes through the digestive system because the less time feed stays in the digestive system, the less time it has to create methane. Um, or it could be just fundamentally changing the biodiversity of the rumen to reduce the amount of methanogenic archaea that's there. Ultimately, these reduce methane emissions by about 1%. Um, diet does have a higher impact. Once again, forage digestibility, uh, that aims to reduce the amount of time that feed spends in the digestive system. And the energy density of diets aims to reduce the amount of feed required full stop. Um, both of them can have quite a significant impact, about 10 to 15%. Secondary compounds also can have quite a large impact, but the problem is that they're required in quite high amounts. Um, so for example, grape mark, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is this product here, which is high in oil and tannins, is required in grams per kilo of feed consumed. So it's quite logistically difficult to get that around the country um, and to store it and transport it. And it's not as viable as something like a supplement. And why supplements are so desirable is because they're required in very small amounts and under the right conditions, they can eliminate methane emissions. Um, so the two that I'm going to talk about are Bovair and Asparagopsis, and that's because these are the two that are commercially available and these are the ones that you're most likely going to encounter or most likely have already encountered. And to start off, I'll talk about Bovair. So this is a compound called 3-nitrooxypropanol. Um, so commercially, it's quite often referred to as 3-NOP or 3-NOP. It's a synthetic compound made by DSM Nutrition, which is a Dutch company, and it's currently available for commercial use in Chile, Brazil, and Australia. And I think it's also coming into the EU as well this year. And how it works is it's a synthetic analog for this enzyme here, methyl coenzyme M, which is required during the last stage of methane production in the rumen. And basically, uh, basically 3NOP binds with the enzyme that methyl coenzyme M would normally bind with to create methane and it's able to do this because it requires less energy for that enzyme to bind to 3NOP than it does for uh, the enzyme to bind to methyl coenzyme M so it's able to outcompete it. It's then metabolized into things already found in ruminants and at very small amounts that there's been no change to the welfare of the animal or agricultural system observed in any studies. In terms of the nitty gritty, there's been about 30 studies on farms of 3NOP, about 20 lab-based studies and nine computer-based studies, including five meta-analyses. Um, so it's been quite well studied. The cost is gonna be about 30 to 50 cents per cow per day. And that's assuming that you're feeding about a gram to a cow or a quarter of a teaspoon. 
but this price is actually linked to the cost of carbon and not the cost of production. So that will likely change based on the value of emissions. In terms of the method of delivery, it has to be consistently fed and consistently available in the rumen as it's digesting to be effective, which is wonderful because it means it's very quickly digested and doesn't accumulate within the animal, but awful for grazing because it makes it very difficult to then make sure that it's consistently available in the rumen of grazing animals. Um, some studies have tried to feed pellets, but they feed them before or after feeding, which reduces their efficacy because they're not available um, for the entire period of digestion. In terms of efficacy, DSM is saying about 30%. Um, for that one gram, which translates to about 50 to 80 milligrams per kilo of feed consumed. You can get higher abatements um, at about 125 to 150 milligrams. You're looking closer to about 50% in a 50% reduction in methane, um, but it's most likely going to be about 60 to 100%, um, 50, 60 to 100 milligrams of 3NOP per kilo. And that's because of the European safety Recommend, the European Safety Panel's recommendations, which I'll get into soon. In terms of availability, it currently is available now in feedlots, and it should come into grazing in the next few years as slow-release technologies develop. Um, there might still be a bit of a shortage of 3NOP, though, because the factory that they're making to create a global supply of 3NOP is still being built and won't be finished for another few years. So that will also impact the price most likely. In terms of the impact on meat and milk, no sensory studies have, have observed any changes. Um, anecdotally, I've heard that it can increase the marbling structure of meat, um, but that hasn't been reflected in any studies. In terms of efficacy, it ranges in between animal types and within animal types. And the variation within animal types is caused by breed, the time of feeding and diet. We're very, very well aware that increases in fiber and diet reduce the efficacy of 3NOP quite substantially. Um, and this is where my work comes in, trying to determine what factors we need to include in the National Greenhouse Gas Inventories equation and make it as simple as possible, but also making sure that it's as accurate as possible, which um, is quite difficult because there is quite a lot of variation between studies. In terms of the impact of production, it's quite straightforward. It's just the greenhouse gas emissions from the production and transportation of the product, which is about 35 to 52 kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilo of 3NOP produced. And that assumed in that equation that the transportation was by truck from Canada to California. So if it's going from the factory that's soon to be built in Glasgow to Australia, that will likely change. But when you consider that one gram of one gram of 3NOP prevents 75 to 105 grams of methane. Um, the impact of production and transportation is negligible. And to put that into context, that means that feeding bovair to one cow for a year is the equivalent of 127,000 smartphone charges. To three cows, it's the equivalent of taking a family-sized car off the road. And to a million cows, it's the equivalent of planting a 45 million tree forest. So it's incredibly powerful. Um, and in terms of uh, impact of production on animals and environments, beyond greenhouse gas emissions, nothing has been uh, observed in any literature. Health and safety has been quite a big concern, especially because there was some issues around nitrate-based uh, methane inhibitors a couple of years ago. However, um, 3NOP is excreted soon after dosage, primarily through the air and urine. There is a small amount that remains in the tissue and in, the, and in milk. Um, fundamentally, these metabolites have no threat to agricultural or non-agricultural uh, ecosystems or to consumers um, and have been found to have no mutagenic or genotoxic, genotoxic potential. Um, furthermore, there's been no negative impact on the carcass characteristics, mortality, mortality, morbidity or fertility of ruminants in any of the 31 studies. The biggest concern is um, NOPA, which is a metabolite of 3NOP that was found in both the meat and milk of animals fed 3NOP. It was about one microgram in the milk, um, in one 
kilogram of milk and five micrograms in one kilogram of meat. Um, and that was after cattle were fed 100 milligrams of 3 and OP per kilo. Um, and this is of concern because it can cause tumours. However, uh, mice were fed 1,500 milligrams um, of 3 and OP per kilo of dry matter intake, and they found it posed no mutagenic or toxic threat to the mice. So at this level, there is no threat to animals or consumers. But to be safe, the European Safety Panel did recommend 60 milligrams with a maximum dosage of 100 milligrams in um, dairy cattle, which the Australian government is applying to all ruminants based on weight. In terms of productivity and performance, there was a lot of hope that supplements would increase the productivity of animals, ideally to offset their cost. However, there's no consistent evidence for that in literature, although there'll sometimes be one study that says that they saw an increase in feed efficiency or live weight. When you put it in a large data set, the difference really is negligible and there's nothing conclusive. In terms of 3 NOP, there's been no changes to milk, carcass characteristics, characteristics or productivity observed. Um, and to measure the impact on productivity, studies looked at the change in volatile fatty acids. They looked at the total number produced and the composition. And as you can see here, this is a breakdown from all of the studies that fed 3 and OP. Down here is the data sets that had no 3 and OP, and then it gets increasingly higher up to 1,200 milligrams of 3 and OP per kilo of feed. And although there are changes in the total, in the composition of volatile fatty acids, the total volume does not change. Um, the biggest difference is that acetate reduced um, in volume and propanate propanate increased, um, and that's due to the increase in hydrogen gas in the rumen, which made um, producing propanate more favourable. In terms of further research that's really interesting for 3NOP, especially for Australian grazing systems, there's been one study on early life interventions of calves, which fed 3NOP mixed in with water for the first 14 weeks of their lives. And then they saw substantial reductions in methane up to a year after weaning. So you can see here, even after 49 weeks, the um, calves fed 3NOP still produced less methane than than the um, control calves. And this is really interesting because it shows that if we dose calves early, we can potentially uh, prevent that adaptation from the rumen um, that resists, uh, prevent that adaptation in the rumen that um, reduces the efficacy of these products. Um, and it also is particularly interesting for grazing systems because it means that one, three NOP is very effective in water, and two, it means that interventions could um, occur very early on in life um, and still have quite a substantial impact on a farm level. In terms of Australian diets, one study that I believe is coming out later this year uh, fed, fed cattle a typical Australian diet with 3 and OP, which had 7% um, fat and 25 parts per million monosin, and uh, had 3 and OP starting at 50 milligrams and up to 100 milligrams. They increased it um, gradually throughout the study over 112 days. At its height, it reduced methane emissions by 99%. And on average, across the entire 112 days, it reduced greenhouse gas emissions by, uh, reduced methane emissions by 78%, which comparing the overseas studies that saw about 30%, um, this is incredibly more significant. And it sort of shows that maybe Australian farmers are going to be able to have higher abatements in methane emissions from uh, 3 and OP than, some, than overseas farmers, uh, which could potentially mean that it's going to be easier to become carbon neutral, it's going to be easier to become carbon positive, and it could potentially mean that farmers that are able to become carbon positive can sell carbon credits without compromising their own sustainability. Um, so that's definitely worth noting and definitely worth reading when it comes out. Now, asparagopsis. Asparagopsis is a macro red algae that's native to Australia. And out of all types of seaweed, asparagopsis has the greatest anti-methanogenic capacity. Um, the IP is owned by CSIRO, who licenses it out to different companies. Um, two big ones are Sea Forest in Tasmania and CH4 World in South Australia that you'll probably be hearing about soon. And asparagopsis is useful is 
Asparagopsis is useful because it stores halogenated compounds in its glands as a defense mechanism. And these bioactive compounds have the capacity to nearly eliminate methane emissions in Australia. So the primary bioactive in Asparagopsis is called bromoform. And the reason why we focus on bromoform is because it has a concentration over a hundred times higher than the second most abundant bioactive in Asparagopsis. So that tends to be the measure of um, measure of uh, strength of asparagopsis. Um, and how it works is it reacts with vitamin B12 to inhibit the efficacy of a enzyme that's required in the last stage of methane production. So once again, it doesn't impact any other aspect of digestion because it targets the last stage of methane production. And when we talk about asparagopsis, uh, talking about two species, asparagopsis taxiformis, which is this one here, which is native to tropical waters in Australia, and armata, which is the top one here, and it is native to temperate um, waters in Australia. But generally, we just refer to them as asparagopsis, and there's been no evidence to show that one is particularly better than the other. In terms of the breakdown of studies, there's been five on-farm studies, four on cattle, one on sheep. Um, there has been about 30 lab-based studies, but not all of them have specifically looked at the impact of asparagopsis and ruminants. Some of them are looking at uh, the usefulness of asparagopsis in other industries, and there have been two meta-analyses that have also been published. Um, in terms of cost, it's looking like it's currently about a dollar per cow per day, but that will likely change as technology increases um, and also reduce just to become more competitive on the market. It is also mixed in with the feed. And once again, it has to be consistently um, consistently available in the room. And so it has to be with every mouthful of feed to get the full effect. In studies, it's about 80%. Um, it can achieve about an 80% reduction in methane emissions, and that's when it's fed at about 0.2% of all organic matter. However, currently all of the um, in vivo studies are based on dried asparagopsis or freeze-dried asparagopsis, and there's recently been quite a big shift away from dried asparagopsis to emulsifying it in oil. Uh, canola oil looks like it's going to be the most common oil, and canola oil is able to have its own uh, mode of action to reduce methane. So you get that double double effect from both, both actives. And you also, re you also require less um, asparagopsis than if you were to dry it. And that is because oil is better at maintaining and stabilizing the bromoform. Um, in the, uh, it's better than it's better at maintaining and stabilizing the bromoform than it is to dry it. Um, so the efficacy and optimal dosage will most likely change in the next few years when studies on asparagopsis and oil come out. Um, in terms of availability, it is also now available in feedlots and will also take a few years for grazing technologies to develop. Um, in regards to the impact on meat and milk, once again, all sensory studies indicate that there were no changes that consumers observed in either meat or milk. The only difference that was mentioned in any study is that uh, asparagopsis for, uh, that um, steaks from cattle fed asparagopsis had darker steaks that had slightly higher microbial counts. So that might increase spoilage, but it wasn't at a super high rate um, to be concerning. Um, in terms of efficacy, once again, there is quite a big variation, but in asparagopsis, it's largely caused by differences in the concentration of bromoform between studies because studies source their bromoform, it was sourced their asparagopsis differently and processed it differently and stored it differently. It ultimately meant that the active ingredient varied significantly across studies, even if they were feeding the same amount, um, which makes it quite difficult. And I think in the next few years when oil studies come out, it's going to be much easier to see the difference between different doses and different animal types. Types, um, because there's going to be that consistently consistency because the oil is so much better at stabilizing asparagopsis. Uh, in terms of the impact of production, the main considerations are farming and processing and creating the actual product. Um, when farming asparagopsis, it can be done through terrestrial farming. So in buckets, as you can see here, 
this picture was taken in Vietnam, or also on fishing line where they attach spores um, into large open ocean farms and harvest and grow and harvest it that way. Um, open ocean farming does require more space. Uh, the CSIRO estimated about 4,000 to 11,000 hectares of space is required um, across Australia to make 34,000 tonnes of asparagopsis per year, and that's the amount that they estimated would be required to halve Australia's methane emissions. The negatives of open ocean, the costs and negatives of open ocean farming is that it does increase plastic pollution and harvests are seasonal unless you can get a consistent heat source. And there is also a concern, although it's native to Australia, that as uh, climate change increases the temperature of water, that Asparagopsis, which grows really well under warmer conditions, is really going to thrive and outcompete other species and really dominate marine ecosystems, um, which is definitely a concern and really emphasizes the need to choose where we where we grow and harvest asparagopsis carefully and consider current and future ecosystems and really consider the trade-offs that we're making in regards to biodiversity. Um, in terms of terrestrial farming, it does require less space, but a lot more resources and infrastructure. And you still have that potential loss of biodiversity because you're pumping water from these buckets. It needs consistent fresh water and you're pumping that water into open oceans. You're still taking those spores and putting them into the open ocean. So they could still um, reduce the amount of uh, reduce the biodiversity of marine ecosystems, um, which is definitely something that needs to be considered. And in terms of processing, storage and transportation, processing, the biggest problem, uh, so processing, uh, the biggest problems are that greenhouse gas emissions are created from freeze drying it or emulsifying it in oil. And also that the halogenated compounds that make asparagopsis um, able to inhibit methane, once, the, once it's harvested, begin to leave asparagopsis. And so it has to be processed and stored and transported properly. Otherwise, there's quite a substantial reduction in bromoform, which is concerning in terms of efficacy. And also because bromoform reacts with ozone in both the troposphere and stratosphere to uh, deplete it. And based on the amount of asparagopsis that the CSIRO estimated that we would produce, the ozone depletion would be about 0.06% uh, in temperate areas and 0.016% in tropical areas, which is um, quite significant, um, but ultimately negligible when we're talking about the amount of methane that it could inhibit. Um, however, this also only accounts for the farming aspect. Uh, in terms of for the, the bromoform release from farming. Um, in terms of storage and transport, um, high temperatures, sunlight and time all reduce the bromoform concentration of uh, asparagopsis. And there are also greenhouse gas emissions that are produced from transportation that need to be considered when making sure that asparagopsis is stored and transported properly. Um, however, when it's in oil, it is pretty stable for 12 months. Um, and is stable at room temperature, but when it's dried or freeze dried, it is more reactive at temperatures over four degrees, um, and it also has a shorter shelf life, unfortunately. In terms of the health and safety, bromoform is a carcinogen, um, so it was really important to make sure that it didn't accumulate in the tissue, meat, or fat. Um, several studies have shown that it absolutely does not and that there's no impact on no negative impact on mortality morbidity or fertility of ruminants in any studies observed um, the only thing is that iodine and bromoform concentrations slightly increased in milk um, but well within the european safe well within the european safety guidelines um, so it's not a very big concern. Um, however, of the two studies that conducted post-mortems, there was some damage to the rumen um, in sheep, which were fed asparagopsis at inclusion rates of 0.5% to 3% of organic matter, which is higher than the recommended dosage. There was some nodular proliferation, um, some discoloration, and some blunting of the rumen um, papillae. And in a study on cattle, which fed asparagopsis at about 67 to 333 milligrams per, uh, uh, 67 to 333 grams per kilo of feed, um, there was uh, 
hemorrhages and ulcers and blisters, which you can see here. But once again, that's at um, that's an inclusion level that is twice to 20 times what will likely be dosed. Um, but there are no postmortems from asparagus from uh, from the dosage of asparagus is currently recommended, um, unfortunately. And in terms of productivity, there was one study that came out in 2020 that observed an increase in daily weight gain in cattle, um, the Kinley study, and that I think got a lot of people very excited that asparagopsis could increase the productivity of livestock. However, uh, when you put it in the context of the other studies and we look at the change in average daily gains um, compared to the control um, and the inclusion rate of asparagopsis, although some studies do show that it increases, there are also studies that show that it decreases. And when you put it into a spreadsheet, it basically says there is no difference. Um, so unfortunately that hasn't been shown. It might change um, when asparagopsis is an oil. It should be noted that in a couple of studies, uh, livestock did refuse feed. It's not very palatable and they didn't like the taste of it, so they refused feed until they were fed something else. Um, so that is what could have, re could have resulted in the reduction in weight, um, but we just need a few more studies to really conclusively say that there is an increase in weight. Um, it's also worth noting that this is just for cattle. Um, in terms of sheep, they didn't measure the impact of live weight, but they did state in the study that they didn't observe any change. Um, I'm sure you're all very interested in grazing and I'm so sorry to tell you that there are no studies currently published on either 3NOP or asparagopsis for grazing. There is currently a Merrill study um, that's being done on 3NOP and different grazing technologies. They're looking at lick blocks and slow release pellets or a few of the things that they're really excited about. Um, and both of them aim to make sure that 3NOP is consistently available in the rumen. Um, and that study should hopefully be coming out next year and really guide where grazing research goes. So I really recommend keeping an eye out for that. Um, there's also more research needed to determine whether or not we can feed it through water and if we can feed it to um, to calves and in in the early years, uh, the early stages of life to reduce methane. Um, that's definitely something that I would recommend looking out for. And in terms of asparagopsis, lick blocks are also being tested and there's also some interest in potentially putting it in with molasses and mixing it in um, to supplement it to cows that way. However, the people who are developing these technologies unfortunately need to make sure that because there are restrictions on the dosage of these methane supplements that although it's consistently available in the rumen, it's consistently available at an amount lower than is um, considered safe, um, which is a tricky balance for them to manage. Other areas where research is heading in terms of both asparagopsis and bovair, asparagopsis and oil, there are two studies that are going to be coming out in the next few, either at the end of this year or early next year that will be really interesting. Um, slow release technologies for grazing ruminants, obviously. Um, looking at studies that could potentially reduce the adaptation potential of the rumen to mitigants is also going to be an area that I think needs some more work. And of course, sheep and goats, there's everyone I've spoken to, there's been such a demand for more study on sheep and goats. And I think as, as um, cattle becomes, more, as, the, as the research on cattle becomes um, more similar, there's gonna definitely be more of a shift towards sheep and goats, which is gonna be really, really interesting to see. And in Australia, the capacity to increase the efficacy of these products through diet, I think is something that has a very significant potential to help us meet our emission reduction targets. And ultimately, I think to put this into context of of sustainable farms and the future of farming in the short term, although of course this, good, this is going to help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is incredibly important because there's only so much <laughs> carbon you can sequester. Um, and ultimately in the short term as well, 
farmers will be able to access premium prices for their products and as well get benefits for preventing emissions. I think it's really important to consider the long-term impact of including these sorts of technologies into agricultural systems. And when we look at it on a long, uh, when we look at the long-term of the impact of these technologies, we can really see that on top of reducing greenhouse gases, which is incredibly important, it also allows farmers the resources and the space to consider other environmental stewardship programs, so things like increasing biodiversity and increasing soil, um, which ultimately is really required to develop strong, diverse, resilient agricultural systems. And so I think one of the biggest uh, pros of methane supplements beyond just reducing methane emissions is that by solving this problem, it allows us to really consider solutions to new problems that need to be addressed. Um, to create the agricultural systems that we really want. Um, and if anyone's interested, this diagram is from the Australian Farm Institute from their sustainability report, which I really recommend. Um, and if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to email me. But as well, the Global Alliance um, recently published a report that summarizes uh, 3NOP asparagopsis as well as legumes and oil. Um, which is a wonderful summary and I really recommend if you have any more questions. And Meat and Livestock Australia also has summaries of uh, interesting new studies that come out in their research, uh, development and reports section of their website. Um, and I think they do a wonderful job of summarising some really interesting studies. Um, and as well, if anyone is interested in assessing your own, uh, your own um, farms, greenhouse gases. On the primary industries website, there are greenhouse gas accounting frameworks for free. Um, and how they work is you put in your inputs and your livestock um, and your trees, and it tells you where your greenhouse gases are coming from. So you can begin to um, figure out which solutions might work best for you when you're trying to reduce your agricultural, when you're trying to reduce your farm's green, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, excellent, thank you so much.